So you've gone under agreement on your house, whether you're buying or selling, ultimately a lot of people have questions about this purchase and sale agreement phase. What is it? Why is it? It's questions we get literally all the time. So I figured the best thing to do was bring an expert in. So this is Dimitri Kersner, Kersner, Fuchs and Hill. Um, there might be people out there that have drafted more purchase and sale agreements at this point, but you're kind of getting old, so I feel like you've drafted <laughs> a couple, quite a few in your lifetime, right? A few, yeah. So, so Dimitri's an attorney. Um, he might be an attorney that you're using, he might just be an attorney that I recommended, or not. So, but he knows a lot what we're talking about. So, to this point, Dimitri, what is a purchase and sale agreement? So, the PNS, a purchase and sale agreement, is a binding contract which requires the seller to sell to you and the buyer to buy from the seller. And that's basically the last step to secure the property and take it off the market, so to speak, and move on to the closing. Which okay. Is clear. Now in some states, I think it's important to know, especially if people haven't um, have bought real estate in other states, a lot of time that initial offer to purchase takes you in, in, from that beginning all the way to the end. Massachusetts is a little bit different. We have this like two tiered system, right? right. So I kind of equate the uh, the offer to purchase, right? The thing that we've already done, that's kind of like asking the girl out on, on the date, if you will. Um, we've done the due diligence, seeing if we really want to go forward yep. with one another. And the purchase and sale agreement is kind of like the engagement ring, right? Like this is when things are getting serious, right? Right? So, <laughs> right? So the offer legally is a binding contract. Right. Now in Massachusetts, we expand on it with the purchase and sale agreement, which then overrides whatever the terms are in the offer, because as we get into it, you'll see that some things can change between the offer and PNS. Well, a great example is the purchase and sale agreement is going to talk about title, right? And how you Correct. receive title. And if there's title issues, right? The offer is just two pages. I mean, right. and how long are generally purchase and sale agreements? Um, 12 to 15 pages or right. so. Yeah. yeah. If you like mundane stuff, you're going to love reading <laughs> this document. Um, all right. So that's what the purchase and sale agreement is, right? What about the process? Like, what should we expect, whether you're on buyer or the seller side? I mean, it's really the same process. So what should you be expecting? So once the offer is done and the inspection, if there is one, is done, then kind of attorneys take over and get into the purchase and sale stage. So in Massachusetts, the seller side generates the first draft of contracts okay. and provides it to the buyer side. Now we are one of the few states where the purchase and sale is kind of a living document where right. each side can amend, add to, or delete from, and attorneys kind of walk back and forth. And they yeah. work back and forth. Do your attorney thing. To do their attorney yeah. thing. So the seller provides it, the buyer's attorney reviews it, makes changes, additions, sends it back. Then they look at it, accept some, change some, and then send it back and back and forth. So it's that. a true negotiation. Correct. Right. And and by the way, this is one of the reasons why us real estate agents, we don't touch these things with 10 foot poles because we're not lawyers. And you can change one word and paragraph dug sure. down somewhere deep and it could change literally the whole meaning of, of said paragraph of course, yeah. and change the aspect of it. That's why we don't screw with these things, the us real estate agents. So, all right, so you attorneys are gonna negotiate back and forth. How long does this generally take? Well, it depends on cooperation, frankly. I mean, right. you can conceivably get it all done in 24 to 48 hours. In reality, that never happens. People are busy, uh, clients are slow in review. So the process can take anywhere from two, three days, all the way up to a week or 10 days, depending on right. how complicated the process is. An attorney's going on vacation. Yes, I, I've, I've seen that before. And that's the big part, right? Is is that it, it's not necessarily a clear case, like this is gonna take three days, right? right. Or this is gonna take four days. Um, so should somebody be concerned that it's taking three days or four days, or maybe you have we have to get an extension. I mean, is there anything that you should be worried about if you're a buyer? No, so extensions are common. Now, during busy times, I would say 90% of PNSs get extended. Yeah. During slow times, it's a little bit less, mainly because people have more free time to work on things. But no, extensions are common. Extensions are also pretty informal, meaning that as long as attorneys agree to one email exchange, or right. uh, mainly email exchange, it's binding and it doesn't terminate It anything. locks them in. Right, right. so um, so that's good. So they there's no set time. Don't be worried about it. Correct. While you guys are negotiating back and forth, what is the client doing? Are they doing anything? Yes and no. So what I typically do is once I have something for the client to read, I send it over. Now, I don't like to send over every single updated version because right. it kind of makes things more complicated. So once I have something that's more or less final, I send it over and the client just needs to read it or 
ask questions that they may have from the contract or maybe their friends or family suggested they ask. So there's some cooperation on the client's part because they need to participate. Right. I don't like people signing documents they haven't seen. It's an important one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you, the client will have to read and ask right. and we go from there. So you're going to send a document that is pretty close to being negotiated now, pretty darn right. close to the final, if not the final quote unquote yeah. version that has been negotiated between you and the other, another attorney. Yeah. Um, at that point, the client's going to review that document, then get back to you with any questions about paragraph 20A, right? right, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to take the time, answer those questions. And then at that point, it seems like everybody's in agreement, right? Unless if we have right. to go back and negotiate yep. a certain change. Um, so once everybody's at agreement, what happens then? So once it's all done, we send the final version to the realtors and they take over from there. Yep. Uh, the attorneys don't usually get involved in signing or collecting of deposits. That's done by the brokers Correct. on both sides. So we kind of pass it on to the realtor and they take over from that, from that point. point. So yeah. we're gonna get the finalized version from the attorneys. And then it's always custom that the buyer is signing. Why, why is the buyer always signing first? So the buyer always signs first. And the reason for that is we want to have consideration for their signature, which is the remainder of their deposit. Okay. Um, because it's a real estate transaction, it's not legal or valid until there is consideration. Right. So the buyer signs, provides a check, and then only then the seller. Check or uh, wire deposit transfer, link, right. something, some type of monetary, right? Um, and and that's, that, that's a really important like part of it, right? And that your initial deposit is with that first offer to purchase, right? right? Generally speaking, the second deposit, at the signing of the purchase and sale agreement, this is gonna be a lot larger sum sure. of money. So yeah. if you have to move money around or you need to cash the money out of securities or something like that, prepare. you ultimately probably wanna prepare for it well in advance before we actually get to that actual day of, of signing yeah. is, is, is something that I personally would recommend. So we've signed the document, we're done with the purchase and sale agreement at that point when's really the next time that they're gonna see you as an attorney well they will see me at the closing table right they will hear from me or for somebody in my office you know a week or so before with last-minute items that are needed um, perhaps closing figures you'll also hear from us right around your loan commitment date right um, if you have a mortgage contingency as a buyer you want to make sure you have that commitment in place by that yep. date so we usually check in either the day before or day off to make sure that's been done. And we also check in with the lender as well. Right. And then also title. I mean, you might have to reach out to them right. about title because you're going to well, do a you, title if, search. Yeah, if you're a seller, you'll hear from us also, you know, hey, we found this problem with your right. title. We need to work on it. And we may need some documents from you from when you bought the place. Yeah. So, And, and I think the point is, is that once you sign the purchase and sale agreement, things are going to kind of get a little bit quieter Very quiet, from yeah. kind of this end. Um, this is the time where you're really head in focused on if you're getting a mortgage, everything mortgage wise. And if you're a seller, you know, it's kind of a little quiet on your world. You're just packing up, getting ready. And the buyer is just, well, you're hoping is just head on focus and, right. and getting uh, their financing, their financing together. So, so that's the purchase and sale agreement. Uh, if you have any questions, any more questions, you know, questions about the process, you know, maybe about your deposit, whatever it might be, then always feel free to reach out. That's why we're here for you, right? Just wanted to do this just because sometimes it makes sense. And I never want you to feel like you're lost in the weeds, if you will. So, uh, you know the best number to get me at, but it's 617-775-7687. Uh, otherwise, uh, I hope you're having a great day and look forward to chatting with you soon. Bye.